19. And uh, for morning service, I'll have a little bit of fun in the message and hopefully helps you see something. And uh, it'll be good. If you don't have any fun, Emily and I sure had a whole heap of fun to figure out how to do it and put it together. Uh, one of those things that is, the, it was dangerous because the more we did, the more it evolved in our head. And the more we thought it out and did things and thought, oh, if we did that, we could do this. And we had to stop at some point. All right? We'll have a good time in the morning service. Get your listening in, sorry. And then uh, as, as today went, we found out a number of people were away or sick. So we have a couple of people that are a couple of kids that are going to be the actors that they don't know it yet. They're pulling double duty. If they're a shepherd, they're a wise man. If they're a wise man, they're a shepherd. And uh, we drafted a couple to be Mary and Joseph. And um, they didn't know until about 3.30 yesterday because we didn't have the idea until about 3.05 yesterday. And uh, it'll, it'll be good. We'll have a good time. All right. Revelation chapter 19. Continue on as we uh, conclude this, uh, work on concluding the, the book of Revelation study. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. He is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that, it, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron, and treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. Those both were cast alive into the lake of of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of his of him that sat upon the horse, which the sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now, not the most pleasant scene to think about. A big battle, and uh, the angels by the sun call all the fowls of the air, and we'll get into some of those things. And so, um, as we, it's kind of interesting how this corresponds. Is our study in the book of Sessom. That second Thessalonians tonight also covers this topic, and so we're kind of looking at it from a couple of perspectives. But this is the second coming of the Lord that we're talking about. So the rapture had already taken place. The church has already been with Christ in heaven. Mary's of the Lamb has taken place. All those other things coming back down to earth. Now, if you notice, as we study now about Christ's first coming. Uh, at Christmas, this is very different. His second coming, correct? His first coming, he came as a as an innocent baby, as, as really a helpless baby, and and, and all of those. But now he's coming as a conquering king. He's coming very different, looking very different this time. And uh, this is the world described in Scripture as a kingdom to come. Is what we're going to be be looking at and. And uh, as we begin to look at this, this period of time is called by many different titles, right? Uh, it's called by many different titles. It's in, in, in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, it's called uh, the regeneration. It's a time of new birth and new life uh, when we go into that millennial kingdom. In Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it's called the times of refreshing. You say, why is it called regeneration? Why is it called the times of refreshing? And then also in Acts 3, verse 21, 
It's called the times of restitution when everything goes back to being the way it was supposed to be. All right? So in the millennial kingdom, the earth is going to kind of be refreshed again. Does that, does that make sense? You understand in the Garden of Eden, the curse wasn't just on man and woman. Yes? Right? The curse was also on the ground, wasn't it? Yes. Can you imagine gardening when there was no weeds? Wouldn't that have been cool? Why would you? Why would you ruin that? No, uh, you know, and all those types of things, and and so we'll kind of go back to that. And uh, Ephesians chapter one verse nineteen designates it as the fullness of times, and uh, Philippians chapter one verse six identifies it as the day of Christ. And so a lot of different things is called, and our understanding of history as those who are followers of Christ, our understanding of human history, this is the culmination of human history. This is what everything is about. Is Christ coming back the second time to establish his millennial kingdom to rule and reign for a thousand years? Right? It's the sovereign rule of God manifests directly on earth through Jesus Christ. Now, this is what we understand is what the everything's about, correct? That coming time. And so as we begin to look at this, there's really kind of a six kind of components of this. So uh, the first thing that we look at is the rule of the sun. The rule of the sun. Take your Bible. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Verse 29 and 30. It says... Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so as we, we look at this, the rule of the, the Son of Man comes, and as we begin to look at this, it comes with different things, all right? So he, he comes, and, and he describes as he's a rider on the white horse, right? And as we read, it gives us more description of him. He's faithful and true. He's called the Word of God. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and he has a name, as we said before, that's only known to him. And not only do his names tell us who he is, but as we look at his appearance, he appears very differently. He has... Eyes is flame of fire. He has many crowns upon his head, and um, and his vesture or his, of a, or a garment of his robe is stained with what? Blood. Yeah. Correct. And so very different than you know when when you think of Jesus, is this the Jesus that comes to your mind? Probably not, right? You know. Uh, but is this Jesus nonetheless? Yes. Okay, so here's where we begin to look at him. And not only do his names and his appearance tell us who he is, but his activities show us a little bit about him. So what do you mean? He righteously judges and makes war. And this is that moment in time where all the people and all the armies of the world are gathered together. And, and as you study out history... Uh, it talks about Gog and Magog coming to descend upon the nation of Israel, and it looks as if they're about to push them off into the sea, and at that moment in time, Jesus comes back, and everything changes. Everything changes. Uh, he descends from heaven. He leads a heavenly host. Uh, so if you don't like horseback riding, don't worry about it. You'll be in your glorified body. You'll be riding a white horse. It'll be okay. Uh, you don't have to worry about holding on. You don't have to worry about doing anything. You just ride in in front row seats, you know, um, and there you are, and so, uh, and people say, are there animals in heaven? Well, apparently there's horses. Say, so what about other animals? Don't know. I just know that we ride back on horses, yes? Is that what scripture says? Say, so where do the horses come from? I don't know. I just read what it says. There you go. All right, and then out of his mouth, there comes a sharp sword, and he'll smite the nations, and a rule with a rod of iron, according to verse 15, and he treads the winepress of his wrath. And so we look at all these things. Now, what's interesting is 
we then get a weird detail kind of thrown in there. Don't you think, like, out of the clear blue, you have Jesus coming back, you have his description, you have always doing, and then all of a sudden an angel appears in front of the sun and begins to bid and call all the birds together. This, that, that, like, if you're reading the Bible, does that just not go, well, that's a bit weird. You know, I, I still say, there's sometimes, I don't know if, you know, my mother-in-law, before she passed away, she, she found very few things funny and very odd things that she liked to watch. But one of those things was, you know, those old black and white Alfred Hitchcock movies that were supposed to be scary, but you can kind of tell the plot a mile away. You know, this reminds me of the plot of, you know, the, if you're, that one, um, the birds don't have to go watch or anything. It's this weird movie about birds that come and attack people and, you know, all that type of stuff. And th this scene kind of, that's what I picture in my mind. If I'm, you know, Probably not as accurate as it could be, but there you go. And, uh, and, and it comes in all the birds. Now, here's an interesting thing. There are certain times of year when the birds actually migrate. And if you look at, you know, study birds and all those types of things, and you look at bird migration patterns, guess where a large chunk of birds' migration pattern goes right over? <coughs> Israel. So when they fly south or fly north, their flight pattern takes them right over that whole section of the earth. So it wouldn't be that hard for God who created those birds and created their migration patterns, yes, to choose the exact right moment when all the birds are all over there migrating to go, time to come back. Would it be? I mean, he's a God of great detail, as you know. If you look at creation, and so it's kind of an interesting thing that, you know, as I began to say this passage of scripture and began to, to look at that, and um, I read that somewhere, and so I, I messaged uh, a couple. I have a, a guy I went to Bible college with, um, who all throughout Bible college he kept saying, and we thought, oh, John, you're you're just in that case. And if you know the guy, he he's a unique guy, like he's an interesting guy. He'd always say, one day I'm going to study Hebrew, but when I do it, I'm going to do it in Israel. We're like, okay, John, whatever, John. Uh, that'd be cool, John. And I guess where he's studying now in Israel, and he's taking all his coursework in Hebrew, in Israel, in Jerusalem. And, he, and you know, the other day I messaged him and said, you know, in Bible college, you, you kept telling me, yeah, I told you I was going to do it one day. You all just didn't believe me. And so he's actually, get, he's actually got a master's degree from a seminary in Israel, taken in Hebrew, and now I think he's working on his doctorate degree just because they asked him if he wanted to come back and do his doctorate in Hebrew, and he said, sure, sounds fun. Um, you say, what's he going to do with it? I have no idea, but that's where he is. So I thought, let me ask him. I said, you've lived in Israel long enough. You've lived in that area long enough. He said, yeah, I've been to where this battle is going to take place. And I said, okay. And he said, and I heard that whole thing about the migration of birds as well. So one year when it was migrating, I went... And I went camping out in that area. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah. Oh, you know, I always do weird things anyway. And I'm like, yeah, okay. So I did that. And he goes, and guess what? I saw constantly going overhead. Birds. Birds. <coughs> and birds. Goes, so yes, the flight pattern of migrating birds goes right over where the, this battle is going to take place constantly every year. I thought, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, so how do you know this? Uh, a native of mine camped out and looked for birds one year. Uh, you say, is that odd? No, it's not odd. Uh, that's just him. Um, and then uh, uh, Brother Paul, if many of you met, led a, a trip to Israel this year. And, um, you know, was posting where he was going to be. And somehow John found out where they were going to be. And he just shows up in the middle of their group. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> this guy, we went about He just rocks up and he's like, "Hey, do you want? I know you're looking at this stuff, but let me show you the real stuff." And I find it funny looking at people who take trips to Israel's photos, and then his photos. Say why? Well, everyone who takes trips to Israel's photos are all the touristy sites, right? Uh, John, you get photos of the markets and like, it's funny. They they've got decorated Christmas lights and Christmas trees and manger scenes and yeah, I don't know. I don't know. 
there you are. Um, but anyway, so all that stuff is there. So we see that, and then we we see in a moment um, as you, you begin to see the the rule of the sun. In Revelation chapter twenty, the beginning, um, you get the removal of the serpent. Right, you get the removal of the serpent. Look at Revelation chapter twenty with me. Verses 1 to 3. 1 to 3 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him uh, that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand, the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And so we get the thing that like we, we all wish would happen in our lifetime. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice if Satan was confined and not able to do his thing anymore? Well, I mean, like, wouldn't that make life a little bit nicer? Well, here he is. He's bound up and thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And notice how it says there's a seal set on him that he would not be able to deceive the nations until a thousand years is up. Here's the amazing thing. That we're going to see as we, we study this, it still um, kind of boggles my mind, but I guess it really shouldn't because the Garden of Eden was a perfect environment, correct? And yet we still rebel and disobey. And people are going to live during the millennial kingdom with Jesus ruling and reigning. And still, when the serpent is released from the pit, will be deceived by the serpent and will once again rise up to rebel against Jesus. Like, in human history, if you study it out, has it ever resulted well for the people who rebel? Satan and the angels? Nope. Adam and Eve? Nope. The entire world of the Battle of Armageddon before when he came back a second time? Did not work out well. So here we go, fourth time's a charm, right? Uh, this shows you mankind, correct? And, our, and, our, and the sin nature that can be deceived and, and all those types of things. And it also shows me this. The world in which we live says if you put people in the right environment, they will come out better. Well, it doesn't matter what environment you put them in. The sin nature can still make us not come out right, correct? We can still sin. I mean, Adam and Eve were in the perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. They still sinned, Yes. These people who will be deceived by Satan at the end of the thousand years were lived under the direct, not, I mean, a direct rule and reign of Christ. They will see Christ face to face. They will be ruled by him. Right? He'll be ruling in Jerusalem, and they'll still find out they'll still rebel. Right? Now, for the sake of time, we'll stop there. Um, and we'll pick this up in the new year. Because we won't be gathered together like this again for growth groups until next year. All right.